ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School World Order. I am your host, the Dallas Professor John Kleisig, author of School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporate Science and Education. And today, I'd like to take a look at the prospects of community schools in the Biden administration. So we've got a new president, Joe Biden, setting up a new Department of Education. The head of that department will most likely be his nominee, Miguel Cardona. And so I'd like to unpack today the prospects of Secretary Cardona promoting community schools under a Joe Biden administration. Okay. So how do we know that? Well, it boils down to who recommended him to Joe Biden. And that is somebody by the name of Linda Darling Hammond. Darling Hammond was very influential in advising the President Obama administration. She pushed a neoliberal agenda that was corporatizing or privatizing. Otherwise, it was a, a neoliberal spin on the big charter school movement that Secretary Duncan was, was pushing. She has her own history, though, prior to that of promoting community schools through something called the Coalition of Essential Schools, which was set up by somebody called Ted Sizer. Okay, and that goes all the way back to something called the Good Lad Study in the 80s. And the Good Lad Study basically rolled out the program for community schools nationwide. And then you have a bunch of different packages of different types of community schools, like essential schools, effective schools, small schools, okay? But these are all brands of community schools, pilot projects that are used as models for the current, the current push, okay? So what is a community school? Simple breakdown of what a community school is would be modeled as such. It has three main components. It's going to provide something called wraparound services or otherwise known as pipeline services and these are going to be delivered through public private partnerships so in other words community schools re require an element of privatization of corporatization what this means is a community school must partner with private companies to provide wraparound services such as in the broad spectrum of healthcare, workforce training, and criminal justice. There's also a data tracking or data analysis component. And then there's a lifelong learning component, which is a term that comes out of the United Nations, UNESCO. And th th this model is, is the model that was designed at the beginning of the Good Lad study. And I, I'll show you in a place called school that right it lays out just this okay including the public private partnerships the corporate business partnerships for workforce training so let's let's unpack the cardona darling hammond connection and let's look at the history of community schools in particular the coalition of essential schools coming out of the good lad study down through ted sizer to darling Hammond, all the way to cardona okay so I'd like to start off with my friend Lois Weiner's new politics article. She pretty much says everything that I was planning to say in this video. So in a lot of ways, my video is just going to kind of show you the documents and back up what she's saying. The preface that she started with, which was in a lot of ways, he really doesn't have himself a direct track record. But as she also notes, which is the focus of this analysis, we do know the circles that he has run in and we do know the history of those circles. And so insofar as he is being promoted by those institutions, those organizations, that agenda, we should at the very least be aware of these developments and keep an eye out. As Dr. Weiner notes here, 
Linda Darling Hammond, she was promoted as what she calls a friend of labor during the Obama administration. But as Lois points out, she did not recommend undoing the privatization or the corporatization of gaining momentum during the Obama administration through charter schools. She largely took this neoliberal approach where she tried to basically make it more equitable, make the privatization of the corporatization more equitable for marginalized groups. Okay, so so where do we see examples of Linda Darling Hammond being supportive of corporatization through school choice, which is a euphemism for school privatization through largely charter schools, but also through education savings accounts, tax credits for tuition, voucher programs, and others. Take a look at Diane Ravitch's blog, and she basically agrees with Lois that Linda Darling Hammond has not repudiated corporate school choice, but has tried to make it more equitable. And one of the means that she uses to make that more equitable is with what is referred to as a portfolio approach with diverse providers. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at this uh, portfolio model with diverse providers. All right, let's go ahead and open this up. This is at the Learning Policy Institute, where Linda Darling Hamilton is president and CEO. Okay. And so, abstract here. And it says the authors look at a range of public school choices currently available in the United States open enrollment, magnet school, charter schools, and schools based on distinct educational models, and examine the degree to which, under varying circumstances, each is equitably accessible, improves student outcomes, and promotes diversity and inclusion. Okay? It says public school choices, but what that means is public-private. So when we're talking about charter school, it is considered a public school because it gets to use the first half of the full term public-private. And it has a private component. They are private companies, which are subsidized by public tax dollars, which makes them public schools, and they have a public charter based on their corporate status okay so let's just take a look inside this file here is the actual report tapestry of american public education how can we create a system of schools worth choosing for all so right away charter schools just got a whole section of charter schools schools based on distinct educational models that's a euphemism for the community schools, which, as I mentioned before, come under an umbrella of different terms, some of them just community schools, but others include essential schools, others are called effective schools, some are called small schools, and there's probably others that I missed. Let's go just to that section, schools based on distinct educational models, and let's actually do a keyword, and there it is, community schools. It's one of the first words used in schools based on distinct educational models. Okay, the last category of schools of choice comprises schools that adhere to a particular educational design or philosophy, such as Montessori schools, community schools, or New York City's international high school model. And, but you, you see here, she's promoting diversity, not in schools, but diversity of schools, meaning diversity of the four types that I identified in my previous video, which are the traditional public, the traditional private, the community school, and the charter school. And then if you watch that video, you'll see that there's actually amalgamations called community charter school. Okay, so it's basically just a basket of stuff on the spectrum from public to public private. So Let's look at the Coalition of Essential Schools and how Darling Hamilton, who recommended Cardona to Joe Biden, how Darling Hamilton is connected to the Coalition of Essential Schools. And then we'll trace the history of that back to the Good Lad study to show that it's always been about corporatization, computerized personalization of the learning process. In other words, data mining and data tracking of the students combined with wraparound services. Okay, so let's look at the Coalition of Essential Schools, which was set up by Ted Sizer and currently holds Linda Darling Hamilton as the vice chair of their executive board. Okay, so in addition to being the executive director of the Learning Policy Institute at Stanford, she is also the vice chair at the Coalition of essential schools. And you'll see that the founder of the coalition, 
for central school is Ted Sizer. And notice here that it's explaining how in 1994, Ted and Nancy, it's his wife, helped to found the Francis W. Parker Charter Essential School. Okay, so they're calling the Essential School a charter school here. But I can show you also that they're also referred to as learning communities. And so they use the community schooling rhetoric or the community schooling language which illustrates that charter schools and community schools have way more in common than they have in contrast, okay? They are both means of privatizing or corporatizing public education, okay? Notice here, look, we envision an educational system that equips all students with the intellectual, emotional, and social habits to become powerful and informed citizens who contribute actively towards a democratic and equitable society. So it's combining the emotional and the social with the intellectual, which if you read into that, you can see that as a window for providing wraparound services, such as mental health counseling, which could be provided through social, emotional learning, through the healthcare or wraparound apparatus. Okay, so if we take a look at the Antioch Center for School Renewal, which is associated with the coalition of essential school. You can see again, the communitarian rhetoric being used, okay? You can also see social emotional learning rhetoric being used, which relates to the mental health and broader healthcare wraparound services. You'll also see workforce training, or workforce schooling, school to work. One of the key terms that Ted Sizer often used was student as worker. And then there's also social justice rhetoric being used. It's used in the context of sustainability, but that just that social justice rhetoric could also tie into the, the criminal justice interventional programs to help at-risk students. Okay. So you see here. Going back to the model I showed you at the beginning of the video, that all the wraparound services are implied in the rhetoric used for this description. Okay, and so to recap what we've gone over so far, it's kind of hard to get a reading on Cardona, but if we look at his circles of influence, and we see that he was recommended to Joe Biden by Linda Darling Hammond, we can see that that circle of influence is the community school circle of influence. How do we know that? Because Darling Hamilton is not only a CEO at the Learning Policy Institute, which pushes community schools, which are the counterpart, not the antidote to charter schools, but she is also the vice chair of the Coalition of Essential Schools. And we know that the Coalition of Essential Schools promotes community schools and also charter schools. And we know that the Coalition of Essential Schools was set up by Ted Sizer. All right. And Ted Sizer actually wrote a book, co-authored it with Linda Darling Hammond. Okay. Not only are they connected in terms of the Coalition of Essential Schools, they've also worked on books together. All right. So they are clearly in the same frame of mind. And I can show you as I have so far that the actual stuff they promoted is basically the same stuff. Okay, so what we see is that Linda Darling Hammond has a long history of promoting and being connected to institutions that push both charter school corporatization and community school corporatization. Okay, so, so let's walk back through time. Let's walk back through time. I'm going to get you all the way back to the 80s by the time we're done. And I'm going to show you during that process, there's a continuity of rhetoric, a continuity of agenda, all the way back to the 80s. All right, so let's go backwards and trace the history of the Coalition of Essential Schools all the way back to the John Goodlatte study in the 80s. And let's show how various administrations have promoted the coalition of the central school models, these community school models, how they have also basically promoted corporatist agenda, which is merely the counterpart to the charter school. Okay, so let's start with the Annenberg Foundation. So if you go to the coalition center 
for essential school reform, partnership with the actual coalition of essential schools. And if we go and look for Annenberg, we'll see that there are several connections. Okay, so you'll see here that this particular organization uses the actual coalition of essential schools model, the CES model. And then you'll see that Annenberg, if I spell it right, Institute, helped to fund a study which was connected to a, an analysis of the research of Linda Darling Ham. Okay, so there's a first connection from the Annenberg Institute Foundation to the Coalition of Essential Schools generally and to Linda Darling Hammond in particular. The next connection we can look at here is that the Annenberg Foundation has connections to Arnie Duncan, who was not only the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools System, which was a hotbed, one of the uh, major engines of charter school privatization during his reign there. But then he also became Secretary of Education under President Barack Obama. And just to cite this source here, um, we're looking at education. So if you take a look here, you'll also see that Ken Rowling, who was the Executive Director of the Chicago Annenberg Challenge, which was a challenge that was funded by the Annenberg Foundation. The challenge was uh, basically like a competition to see who could come up with the best community school, small school, essential school, effective school, all these different baskets of community schools. And you'll see here that Rowling, what does he say about the Annenberg funds and their impact on Duncan? Rowling says that the research project helped shape the agenda for Arnie Duncan, the current chief executive officer of the Chicago Schools especially on improving teacher quality. Okay, so Annenberg basically promoted the charter school movement under Duncan, who, who for sure pushed other, what could be called community school projects. Okay, and then another connection would be the infamous connection between President Barack Obama and Bill Ayers, who was the weather underground bomber. And the CNN article here says they crossed paths on the board. The implications seem to be that they more than crossed paths. We shall see here that where did they cross paths? It was at the Annenberg Foundation or through the projects of the Annenberg Foundation, in particular that Chicago Annenberg Challenge. You'll note also that what was Bill Ayers promoting? Small schools, small schools project. The board, for example, gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to Bill Ayers' small schools project. And I'm going to show you that small schools, that term specifically, that's a Ted Sizer term. Ted Sizer comes up with that. So what were we talking about? We're talking about Bill Ayers in partnership with Obama promoting small schools, in other words, promoting a version of community schools that comes out of Ted Sizer's Coalition for Essential Schools, which is the same place where Linda Darling Hammond gets her ideas for equitable portfolios of charters and community schools. And she is the one who is promoting Cardona. And then we can go back again, just to show you that Annenberg gave money to President Clinton today, this is the New York Times, 1993, Clinton hails Annenberg's $500 million education gift. President Clinton today applauded the philanthropist Walter H. Annenberg for his $500 million gift to public education. And then where did some of that money go? Well, it went to Ted Sizer or Theodore R. Sizer. Coalition of Essential Schools. And how much did Sizer get? I think it's 50 million. It's 50 million. 50 million will be awarded to the new Annenberg Institute School of Home at Brown University under the direction of Theodore Ted Sizer. Okay? So you've got the Annenberg Foundation, you've got one corporate foundation providing funds to a basket of different community school projects that are all intertwined politically. So they're funding Ted Sizer, who sets up the Coalition of Essential Schools. They're funding Bill Ayers, who was connected to Obama through the Small Schools Project, also impacted 
Arne Duncan as CEO of Chicago Public Schools. Then he becomes the Secretary of Education under Obama. And Linda Darling Hammond, who is the Executive Director of the Coalition of Central Schools, she really advises that team on what to do. So all of these people have ties to not just Annenberg money, but the Coalition of the Central Schools and Ted Sizer's small schools slash community schools project. Okay, and so this is an interesting spot where I can sort of jump off to reemphasize that charter schools and community schools have always been part of a portfolio of corporate school reforms. Uh, they have been pushed by the same corporate foundations, the same big business slash big government interests. It's always been the same. Okay. And here's another example of what I mean. Look, community schools and charter schools not only have very much in common, but there's also not just overlap, even when there's distinction, they can literally be the same thing. And I'll just show you the list here of, look, community magnet charter school. So that actually adds the, the magnet version of the charter slash community school. And so you got, you got three of these interchangeable terms all mashed together in an alphabet soup. Here's the community charter school of excellence in Tampa, Florida, community public charter school here, community charter school of Patterson, community academy of Philadelphia. But look, it's a community academy of Philadelphia charter school. Okay, Piedmont Community Charter School, you get the point, right? Okay, so in order to get a sense of what Cardona is going to be implementing, we have traced back his connections to Linda Darling Hammonds and the Coalition for Central Schools. And then we've traced that back further to the founder, Ted Sizer. And now I want to trace that back one step further to the John Goodlad study, which produced four important books, Schooling for a Global Age, A Place Called School, Arts in the Schools, and Communities in Their Schools. Those four books essentially became the manuals for how to proliferate or implement community school programs in their various packages that became essential schools, effective schools, small schools, et cetera, okay? So I'll just pull down here. Charlotte Thompson, Ezra Beats, Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. And just read the section on page 151. A study of schooling in the United States by John Goodlad, Dean of the Graduate School of Education, University of California, Los Angeles, and associated with the Institute for Development of Educational Activities, funded by Kettering Foundation was compiled in 1979 after being researched over a period of several years. Under Dr. Goodlad's direction, trained investigators went into communities in most regions of the country. The result of the landmark report was a place called School Prospects for the Future, Schooling for a Global Age by James Becker, Communities and Their Schools by Don Davies, Arts and B Schools by Jerome Houseman. Okay. And John Goodlay actually wrote the foreword for some of those books, and they were all funded by the same corporate foundation. Okay, so let's take a look at communities and their schools here. John Davies, the editor, a quote from John Goodlad here. And if we flip down to publication information, You'll see here, conducted under the auspices of the Institute of Development of Educational Activities, directed by John Goodlad, as I just read in Charlotte's book. Now look at the foundations that supported it, the Danforth Foundation, International Paper Company Foundation, John D. Rockefeller the Third Fund, Martha Holden, Jennings Foundation, Charles F. Kettering Foundation, Charles Stuart Matt Foundation, here's the National Institute of Education. Uh, the Needmore Fund, Metamorphosis Inc., the Rockefeller Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, and then the United States Office of Education. So you'll see several corporate foundations here, including the Rockefeller Foundation and another Rockefeller philanthropy as well. All right, so, so it's funded by literal robber baron philanthropy. So what's the connection then between Sizer and those projects, those manuals? Well, one is that it basically follows the instructions in here, but if you take a look at the 
special 20th anniversary edition of A Place Called School by John Goodlad. Take a look at the foreword. The foreword was written by none other than Theodore Ted Sizer. So his foreword is called Back to a Place Called School. And what does he have to say about the Good Lad study and uh, the principles that came out of all of those, those books and all that research? He says, quote, Good Lad's team was advised by an outside group with impeccable scholarly credentials and was supported by 14 of the country's largest and most discriminating private foundations. This was a Rolls Royce of educational inquiry. Okay, so basically he's telling you what I just said, that from the get-go, this stuff is bankrolled by private foundations, in other words, corporate foundations. And he, what did he say? It's a Rolls Royce. Okay, so let's take a look at the inside of a place called School by John Goodlad. Okay, so you can see here that the original copyright for the first printing was 1984. We're going to look through this 20th anniversary reprint edition. What I want to show you is that the community schooling model has been the same since its inception. That includes the wraparound services for public-private partnerships, the lifelong learning, and also the data analysis through technology. So let's take a look at some of those excerpts. Okay, and so you can see here, this is page 343, there is a section on career education and the world of work. So basically a section on workforce training. Okay, and so then I'll flip forward and show you that this career training school to work program includes business partnerships, public private partnerships in which the businesses themselves will provide the workforce training, not through the schools through traditional vocational study. Okay, so here's where he's going to tell you that your vocational training, your workforce schooling should be delivered not through vocational courses at the school, but by the businesses themselves partnering with the schools to train them for whatever are the in-demand industries in order to meet the community needs, so to speak. So it says your vocational training is necessary and desirable for most communities, but I have argued that schools should not do it. The superintendents and principals of schools in our sample, allowing the vocational education program to consume 40% or more of the teaching force should be upgraded, not commended. As they worked with business leaders to assure the availability of the training portion elsewhere, or even after regular school hours in the building, they might have produced a more balanced curriculum. So you can see here that Goodlad does not have a problem with workforce training. He just thinks that it should be carried out by the businesses themselves in partnership with the school, either by training them after hours in the school or in their own training centers, but through some community-based school business partnership. Okay, so here's a section on technology on page 340, going over into 341 in a chapter called Beyond the Schools We Have, all right? Okay, so let me just read some of these tapes. Microcomputers, of course, are a new phenomenon in an area which writers have long been relaying to our educational future. For decades, they have predicted sweeping changes in the conduct of schooling as a consequence of startling advances in technology and their infusion into schools. But we found little use of calculators, computers, or even the earlier forms of electronic aids such as films, film strips, and television. The technological revolution appears to be sweeping around schools, leaving them virtually untouched, even while purchasing microcomputers is becoming the in thing for school districts to do. So basically, he's stating here that it's a slow start in the 80s, right? But read this next paragraph, and it's going to sound very much like what's going on right now. Now, however, some predictions of change can be made quite confidently given present trends. Increasingly, school districts will maintain computer-based information systems to provide employees with detailed information to explain the difference between their gross and net wages, to compile information about administrators, teachers, and students, to store test information, 
and so on. Using desk consoles located in their offices, principals will be able to call up more information about the student body than they know how to use. At a slower rate of increase, two-way systems will provide face-to-face -face communication between district superintendents and the principals in the schools. And there will be more settings like Irvine, California, where teachers-to-be in the University of California employ two-way video to observe and raise questions about classroom practices in the nearby schools. For children and youth to become functionally literate and their understanding and use of computers will be recognized as a necessity, not a frill. So notice here that in 1984, John Goodlad is telling you that the modern community school is gonna incorporate computer technologies in order to data mine students for their learning analytics and their learning metrics so that principals and administrators can plan curriculums and they will also incorporate video teleconferencing, such as all the stuff we're seeing right now, which includes Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meets, Bongo, and other video conferencing computer technologies. Okay, and then I wanna show you how the data analysis component ties in. So I wanna show you here that, again, in 1984, John Goodlad is telling you that modern community school is going to incorporate data tracking and in particular not just tracking data in terms of academic skills and workforce training but also psychological behavioral data for cognitive behavioral conditioning or what we might call today social emotional learning okay so let's read this section here we use data from teachers, students, and observers to determine the variety of teaching practices and materials used in classrooms, different pedagogical approaches, use of textbooks, other books, worksheets, films, film strips, slides, television, teaching machines, etc. Students' perceptions were used to gain insight into the clarity of teachers' verbal instructions and expectations, as well as their enthusiasm and enjoyment of teaching. Likewise, we sought to find out whether teachers came across negatively or positively in their relations with students. Positive affect was noted whenever teachers used humor, supportive touching, or other overt expressions of enthusiasm and interest in students. Negative affect was recorded when the teacher was demeaning, sarcastic, punishing, or angry in interactions with students. Another dimension of teacher-student relationships explored was the kind of student behavior reinforced by teachers, whether conforming and passive or independent and autonomous. Finally, we explored a set of students' relationships with each other. So you can see here that they're not just collecting and analyzing data that pertains to teacher performance or student learning in terms of academic knowledge or even workforce skills. They're also tracking the psychological data in terms of the student's affect as well as the teacher's affect. You can even see the Skinnerian operant conditioning language embedded into that paragraph. They're analyzing basically positive and negative reinforcements, punishments and rewards based on either humor or sarcasm respectively. And they're looking at how all those psychometrics feed into the overall programming, planning, budgeting system, the total quality management of the community school and its public-private partnerships with wraparound services and include mental health or social services, criminal justice intervention, workforce placement, and then other recreational lifelong learning services such as daycare, elder care, et cetera, okay? All right, so for those who would suggest that there is an earlier model of community schooling that does not involve corporate government partnerships and big tech data analytics, you could see from these excerpts here that according to John Goodlad, community schools have always been designed as public-private corporate government partnerships that provide workforce training and health and social services through microcomputer technologies managed by data analytics. And this is the model that Ted Sizer used for his Coalition of Essential Schools, which is the model that Linda Darling Hammond 
likewise has promoted, which is the model that we should expect Secretary Cardona will be implementing. So last thing I'd like to look at is some of the Ted Sizer stuff. Okay, so, so let's look at Ted Sizer's, some of the principles for his, his essential schools. And then let's look at some of the news articles, like what was the press saying about him at the time, what those reports said. And let's also just look at how the language in these reports and in his own principles parallels the same stuff that is being pushed or has been pushed by the coalition of central schools, including people like Linda Darling Hammonds, and then the small school associates such as Duncan and uh, Ayers and Obama, and also potentially now Cardone. So we have diverse practice, shared ideas, the essential school by Theodore Sizer. This is an article that appeared as chapter one in Organizing for Learning toward the 21st Century, 1989, National Association of Secondary School Principles. So that's the citation. Okay. Let's just look at, for a quick cursory review, some of Charlotte's notes. So we see to capitalize, interesting language there, on personalization, well, we can understand that as the euphemism for competency-based program instruction through technology, uh, decisions about the course of study, the use of students and teachers' time, and the choice of teaching materials and specific pedagogies must be unreservedly placed in the hands of principal and staff. That's a weird second. I mean, if staff included teachers, I guess that makes a little more sense, but that's such a broad term that it implies to me, not just teachers, but wraparound services, which is gonna be some of your corporate partners. So your, your corporate partners, and your administrative, bureaucratic, big government types, there are people that are gonna tell the teachers what you're gonna do. So here's that concept, student as worker. Student as worker, which workforce training, school to work pedagogy. Nowadays, the, a, a buzzword you hear would be career pathways. This also has an analogy in terms of the performance-based assessments, right? So in other words, it's what the student does, performs or works as opposed to what the student conceptually understands abstractly or just intellectually or academically generally. Here we've got uh, no strict age grading and with no systems of credits. So in other words, getting rid of the traditional assessment and that means to replace it with the performance-based assessments, which doesn't mean like a creative thesis or a lab experiment or some sort of organic expression of the student's intellect. It means performance on a module. It means performance because it's all about data analysis to fit into the total quality management of the, of the, uh, the planned economy. So we're talking about getting rid of grades. We're talking about just right, assessing the student's biometric psychometrics in terms of their workforce competence. Okay, so let's zoom in here and notice that principle two is integrating mastery learning and competency-based education or the rhetoric of both of those pedagogies, which although have nuanced differences, basically are just on the same spectrum. It's just that competency-based education personalizes or enables the student to self-pace the rate at which they achieve mastery, which, which basically just means, well, let's read what it means here. The school's goal should be simple that each student master a limited number of essential skills and areas of knowledge. While these skills and areas will, to varying degrees, reflect the traditional academic disciplines, the program's design should be shaped by the intellectual and imaginative powers and competencies that students need, rather than by subjects as conventionally defined. So that means that mastery doesn't mean mastery of the conceptual understanding of whatever subject it is that's being studied. It just means that right, you've mastered the ability to perform whatever function you need based on your role in the, the workforce caste system. It's all about the efficient functioning of the community and the community is largely the economy based on the corporatist model. And so that means that what you need as a student or as a worker bee is to be able to perform your functions effectively. So that's why another term he used was less is more. And that's what we're talking about here. It's what we mean by competency-based education. Okay, so if anybody thinks I'm conflating mastery learning with competency-based education based on a loose association of Sizer's essential school principles, let's just take a look at what a cursory internet search of the two terms pulls up. 
which you can see here, competency-based and proficiency-based education are often used as synonyms for mastery and learning in different regions by various groups. Okay, but the essential and truly transformation element all of these is the same, enabling students to move away or move forward at their own paces as they master content. Okay, so here's the e learning industry. So, this ed tech interest group is describing competency based learning as the process by which you pace yourself until you can achieve that mastery. Learners can return to challenging competency until they achieve mastery. So, the mastery of learning language is embedded. Is embedded in it. Okay, here's the Aurora Institute, uh, competency based education and indicator led reforms taking root in schools and districts across the country. The concept behind mastery of uh, sorry, competency based education. Simple learning is best measured by students demonstrating mastery of learning rather than the number of hours spent in classrooms. So again, competency based education is just the different means by which you achieve mastery learning. Now, in another video, I'll show you that mastery learning is actually the same as direct instruction, also outcomes-based education, all of which are just like there's a nuance here between CDE and mastery learning. There's nuances, but they are on a spectrum of pedagogies that all work together for and towards workforce planning or workforce training for a, a, a corporate government planned economy okay, that is managed by Program instruction, big tech data mining, and social credit. All right, so let's just look at some of the Ted Sizer, some of the news. Okay, so here's one from the Associated Press. I don't have the date on this. I only have the author, Alice DeGilio, in the Associated Press, the title is Schools Where Less Is More. Schools where less is more, there's this competency-based education mantra or rhetoric. And you can see it also down in here where it is understood in all this that student enters second uh, entry center is competent. It's competent. All right, so take a look at this section here. Notice that we've got the performance-based mastery learning rhetoric being used. And then here we've also got what sounds like the mental health <clears throat> wraparound service rhetoric and then competency-based education stuff. Here, so it says, there are no grade levels and promotion is accomplished when the student can successfully demonstrate in what the coalition calls an exhibition that he or she has mastered the material included in the school's program. The exhibition may be a written paper, a laboratory experiment, response to questions, any number of things. That sounds like a more reasonable model for performance-based assessment, which wouldn't bother me. Probably be a lot better than a standardized test. But the ultimate goal is eventually to move into the, uh, as I showed you, the TQM articles, Total Quality Learning Inc. and those, those documents, IBM stuff is to move toward an automated program instruction assessment because that's the best way to personalize something. I mean, nothing can personalize better than biometric, psychometric, empirical data, a real-time analysis all day long as the student's on a module with a facial recognition camera, a biofeedback wearable, and an adaptive learning cognitive and behavioral feedback analysis, okay? So here in the second paragraph, the relationship between the student and teacher is meant to be not only pedagogical, but personal, the teachers offer and its counselors outside the classroom. Okay, and so again, to personalize that performance-based assessment, we might need to consider your mental health conditions. And the best way to do that might be helpful to have the teacher be in the counselor role, but uh, what would be better is if we just monitored your psychological activities on a real-time basis. And then the last one here, and it is understood in all of this that a student entering secondary school is competent. Right? So using competency-based language once again. Last part here, you can see an economic or a TQM incentive here in that, right, it's going to be cheaper. He's saying it's going to cost no more than 10% uh, of a conventional high school. So there is your economic incentive. There's the workforce planning facet to it. All right, let's look at this Wall Street Journal piece. So this is from Wednesday, December 28, 1994, Wall Street Journal. 
Steve Stecklow is the author. Now, it's interesting here, this title and the piece in general is critical of Sizer's stuff. But the interesting thing here is that although, right, the Wall Street Journal is being critical of it, if we scroll way down, we'll see here that the Exxon Education Foundation connected to the Exxon Corporation gave $2.9 million to Sizer. So Wall Street Journal might be critical of the Exxon Foundation of the Exxon Corporation. They're okay with giving them $2.9 all right, and so what are they doing with it? Same song and dance. Limited number of skills to demonstrate mastery, not via text performance-based engineering. Okay. So you have a private foundation, a private company, funding Ted Sizer's projects here to basically implement limited skills or his competency-based education towards a mastery, learning outcomes-based education through performance-based assessments. Okay. So I've walked you back in time through history, starting from Joe Biden's nominee for Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona. I started with him. I walked you back to his promoter, Linda Darling Hammond. Then I walked you back to her ties to Ted Sizer, through the Coalition of Essential Schools, all the way back to John Goodland. Now that I've unpacked some of the Ted Sizer stuff, Let's go ahead and wrap up by bringing it back to the present to demonstrate that the small schools movement, which was promoted by Bill Ayers during a time when he crossed paths with President Obama through the Annenberg Foundation, that that small schools movement actually begins with Ted Sizer is passed down to Linda Darling Hammond and also links up with all of the data tracking and data analysis through the public-private wraparound partnership that I've illustrated. Okay. So let me show you first that the small schools movement starts with Ted Sizer. Okay, so notice here that we're on Amazon's website and they are selling a book entitled Small Schools, Big Ideas, The Essential Guide to School Transformation. So using both the small schools language and the essential schools language in the title. And notice that the foreword is written by Theodore R. Sizer, Ted Sizer, and his wife, Nancy Faust Sizer. Okay, now let's look at an Education Week article titled Small Schools, Big Ideas, authored by Thomas Tobe, December 3rd, 2003. And you can see here that Sizer is referenced multiple times in the article. Okay, so notice here that Ted Sizer is associated with the small schools movement in this article. And notice here that they are demonstrating that the community school movement in particular, the small school movement has much in common, ironically, with charter school and voucher advocates. So as I mentioned, community schools and charter schools are part of a basket of public-private partnerships. And notice here that examples of individuals who link together the charter school movement with the community school movement generally and the small school movement in particular, one of those people is Ted Sizer. We might also note that you can also do a cursory internet search of the terms Ted Sizer and small schools. And you can see CES printing, that's Coalition of Essential Schools printing. Why small schools are essential, you'll note in here there's references to Sizer. This is that Stanford think tank. Center for Opportunity Policy and Education, which we looked at earlier can open up here. This is a document filed at the U.S. Department of Education. Look for references to Sizer. We can see there's quotes excerpted from a piece entitled, Smaller Learning Community Structures. And then again, another quote from Smaller Learning Community Strategies. And so you can see that Ted Sizer is intimately linked with the small schools movement. Okay, and let's also not forget that the small schools movement has ties to the Obama administration through Bill Ayers and the Annenberg Foundation, which also impacted Secretary Arne Duncan when he was CEO of Chicago Public School System. So now let's show that Linda Darling Hammond is also a promoter of the small schools movement, which is part of the community school movement more broadly and part of the coalition of essential schools in particular. So you've got here a 
publication entitled Oakland Unified School District New Small Schools Initiative Evaluation. The authors include Linda Darling Hammond. This is published at the School Redesign Network at Stanford University, which is where she is Emeritus Professor of Education. And that's also where she founded Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy in Education. So that source that we just looked at for small schools, she founded that. And here again is her as CEO of the Learning Policy Institute. So let's just see who funds the Learning Policy Institute. And if we go to the About page and we scroll down, you can see funders include Atlantic Philanthropies, Carnegie Corporation of New York, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Ford Foundation, David and Lucille Packard Foundation, I'll show you the Hewlett Packard Foundation is also funding the Learning Policy Institute, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, and the Stewart Foundation. Okay, so if we go to the Hewlett Foundation, we'll see that this is the foundation of William and Flora Hewlett, William and David are the two Hewlett's who founded the Hewlett Packard Company. And so this is the private foundation of the Hewlett Packard HP Corporation. And so we look at their grants section here, you can see that they provided the Learning Policy Institute with $3.75 million in 2018 over a term of 36 months for the purposes of helping with education programs, in particular K through 12 teaching and learning. So what are HP's interests in education other than perhaps providing desktops and laptops for distance learning and other online e-learning? Well, go to HP Education Solutions and you can just scroll around on their website here. They've got a mission here to reinvent learning kind of sounds like reimagine learning, which is what the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is pushing along with the World Economic Forum. You see here, this young man has some VR goggles on and you can scroll down a little bit more. And there's a couple articles on new realities in education, which must be a euphemism for virtual realities and or augmented realities. You can see the child here, this young lady has some more VR goggles on. And then another article, are classrooms plugged into reality? Get the facts on AR and VR usage in classroom and the globe and how it can elevate learning across various subjects. So there is your performance-based assessment, your non-grading assessment. The student is gonna have their VR or their AR goggles on and that technology is gonna data mine their biometrics and their psychometrics as they try to perform a particular workforce task on their VR or AR module. And based on how that student performs on that module, those algorithms are gonna dictate not only which jobs that student gets, but also his or her access to the larger public square through social credit data. If you'd like to learn more about HP's investments in ed tech that's going to data mine students' biometrics and psychometrics for the purpose of workforce placement and social engineering, you can take a look at Allison McDowell's blog, A Wrench in the Gears, and you can look at this particular article titled Hewlett Packard and the Pitfalls of Deeper Learning in an Internet of Things World. So she's got a lot of really nice infographics here, but she'll also walk you through how HP wants to use their computer technologies to data mine students for the purpose of social impact investment, which plugs into a program in the Every Student Succeeds Act called Pay for Success. It basically means that big companies will invest in students, especially poor students or marginalized or otherwise impoverished students but she'll also walk you through the ways in which HP is pushing technologies that will data mine students in order to broker social impact investment bonds geared towards social credit algorithms. You get the point. There's one more connection that we should illustrate. And then you can see that at the Yale School of Management Educational Leadership Conference 2019, what do we have? We got Miguel Cardona. And who else is there? Well, if you look at some of the other people involved here, you've got people who are involved in venture capitalist organizations. And what is it focused on? It's ed tech stuff. Kickboard, Learn Platform, APDS, Better Lesson, Galvanize. CEO of Convolved. 
uh, you'll see that Convolve is a social enterprise that takes a holistic approach to fighting student absenteeism, combining technology and tools and human interventions to increase funding to school. It sounds like maybe some of that blockchain attendance software that Allison McDowell talks so much about. There's another one, okay, Managing Director Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, and what is she pushing here? Some more ed tech platforms, some of which overlap, you got Kinball, Power Schools, Global Explore, etc. Okay, so he's on a panel here with a bunch of corporate technologists. Okay, so that's a nice way to round up and tie everything back together from the small schools movement to the coalition of essential schools to community schooling more broadly and generally. From John Goodlad to Ted Sizer to Linda Darling Hammond all the way up to Miguel Cardona today. If you'd like to know more about community schools, public-private partnerships in education, or big data mining of the student body, check out my website, schoolworldorder.info. Thanks for your time. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you'd like to check out more of my research, go to my website, schoolworldorder.info where you can find archives of all my interviews, all my articles, and a bibliography of all my citations. There's also links to all my social media and video platforms. And you can sign up for my email list too, where you will receive notifications whenever I produce a new article, interview, or video. To support my work, become a research member for just $5 a month and you'll gain access to my WebBrain database, which contains Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's archive of U.S. Department of Education files and other rare historical documents. The database will be updated with weekly document dumps, and you will be notified whenever I upload a new dossier. Thanks again for watching. Peace.